Welcome to Leafs Talk with uh, Justin Cuthbert with the super official backdrop. If you're watching on YouTube and Sportsnet Plus, looking like you just called the game, uh, looking handsome as ever. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Uh, that was an enjoyable one. Uh, Justin Cuthbert, of course, of fan pregame uh, fame, uh, wonderful contributor to Sportsnet Friday Night of the Fan, and tonight to Leafs Talk. I got to tell you, I didn't think I would start here. Didn't think I'd start with Mike Sullivan. But how does a man who is two assists away from 1,000 about to enter the top 10 in the points in the history of the National Hockey League not see the ice in three-on-three -three overtime when you are fighting for your playoff life, life tooth and nail, Justin? How does that happen? Yeah, I, I don't know how to begin to answer that question. I mean, something's wrong with NHL coaches, it seems, where it's just like the, the reflex or the reflex – uh, is just to be protective, just to be conservative. I'm not really sure what it is, but like Sheldon Keefe has fallen ill from this syndrome many times <laughs> yeah. before, right? Oh, like we've the done camp this. Years. You guys have done it over and over and over in the camp years. Yes, exactly. Like I just don't understand uh, how it's possible, especially when Sidney Crosby's not in like com complete control of game of the game, but the main protagonist by every stretch uh, of the word where he's just kind of front and center. And when a guy like Sid is front and center, feeling it as he was, not to say he was like dominant or unstoppable in the game by any stretch of the imagination, but if you believe in like, you know, endings and, and, and you know, things happening a certain way, like Sid scoring an overtime in that game, uh, winner in that game would have made a lot of sense, but uh, Sullivan didn't give him that chance. Yeah, I just, you know, for the last 10 minutes of that third period, I thought Sid was playing harder than I've ever seen him play. Like, I just, the yeah. the the way he was leaning on everybody, sticks on sticks, just the chances that he was creating that beautiful pass off the sideboards to Brian Russ when he tips it up towards the top of the net and Samsonov makes a great save. And I don't didn't want to start here, but I just was sitting there watching him like, O'Connor? Where's Sid? Like, how are you not putting Sid out there? And he doesn't touch the ice. He has his foot over the boards when it goes down into the into the Leafs zone when McCabe, or sorry, the Penguins zone when McCabe ends up scoring. So, yeah, that uh, that was a perplexing one. Uh, the man that usually sits in the window I'm sitting in to the left and <laughs> to the right, he decided to choose his Super Bowl over go. He chose to go to the the home opener instead of the Leafs versus Dubas with a chance to knock him out. I got to say, I, I know you've probably listened to this show a ton. You've probably heard my takes here and there on what my thoughts on Dubis. I got to tell you, it mattered to me tonight. I had the playoff. I had the playoff nerves. I was really, really, I don't know, man. I just, the blood was pumping towards the end of that period. Sid was looking great. I thought getting Malkin looked a lot better. And the, for the least to get that, that actually got a little bit of reaction out of your boy. That overtime winner, I had to film a little post-game chirp video to see Dubas heading for the exit. Oh, you got that, that was, off too. Oh yeah, buddy. That one okay. felt good. I'm not going to lie to you. That one felt really, really good. I, I, I can't lie to the Leafs Nation fans here. Well, you don't skip this Leafs Talk episode because of what we're about to see here with Kyle Dubas yes. and, and Jason Spezza. Like, you just cannot give up on this opportunity. And like, listen, I was the biggest Jason Spezza fan, I think, going when he was a member of the mm -hmm. Toronto Maple Leafs. But following Kyle Dubas... To Pittsburgh after Dubas said he'd never go anywhere else. And mm -hmm. it seemed like, you know, Spez is coming here because he'd retire over playing for the Winnipeg Jets if they decided to claim him off waivers all those years ago. And then the first flight they could catch out of Toronto, they're taking like, oh, yeah, turning around and walking out. I mean, it's the best. It is the best. I will never tire of that. And that's what we were talking about on the fan pregame today. I got the devil and the angel on each shoulder right now because mm -hmm. I cannot cheer against Sidney Crosby, but I boy, know. can I cheer against Kyle Dubas and Jason it's Spezza right now. I guess one point doesn't suffice either. Like, it's it's a good point, I suppose. Maybe they mm -hmm. need it too. But, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it's made cheering for Sidney Crosby really difficult, and that was never, ever a chore. No, and it's, I mean, that is my thoughts exactly on how complicated this has been, is just to have... Oh, yep. Heading for the exit, fellas. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, yep. got the jackets on already. Feel like they knew it was coming. Uh, I, because Sidney Crosby, I think, uh, probably similar to you, is maybe my favorite athlete of all time. I just, I, I love yep. the guy. I revere him. I just, I want him in the playoffs. It would be much better to have him in the playoffs. And ultimately, 
that overrides my, you know, somewhat disdain of Kyle Dubas and sort of what he represented at the end here. So I think I still would like to see Sid in there. If there's going to be one of those crappy teams at the bottom of the East, that's going to lose in five games in the first round. But yeah, to have it go head to head, come down to Toronto like this, have him standing up there and have that happen. I mean, if you're a non Dubas fan, that's as good as it gets. That's as sweet as it gets. And yeah, it's an awesome moment for Leaf fans to have. And on the overtime winner there, I think, you know, it's a microcosm because we'll talk about uh, Matthews getting to 65 here in a second. But this is the way I'll sort of transition into Matthews. I thought the plays he made in overtime are just a sort of a microcosm of the new sort of player he's become since not having Martin on his line where he goes down here and he wins a battle and one hand saucer out to the point, goes to the sideboards, receives a pass per perfectly. First instinct is pass, finds it right on the tape. Like the way that he started to play without Marner is really remarkable to me. And I feel like he looks better now than he has with Marner in years past. And if that's what's so tantalizing about having these guys split up, I thought he looked excellent again tonight without Marner on his line. Well, there's an easy Pittsburgh parallel here, right? Because uh, that's what Sidney Crosby had to do for years, right? Play with someone other than a superstar, right? Yeah. And I don't know if Matthews is unequivocally better this way with the Pittsburgh model, which is, hey, if there's going to be stars on the team, they got to be spread out. Mm -hmm. The years they won the Stanley Cup back to back 2016, 17, you got Phil Kessel, William Nylander on a third line. You've got Evgeny Malkin on the second line. You got Sidney Crosby doing his thing. But without Marner, he looks more like Sidney Crosby. That is Austin Matthews. Like he just looks like the more complete player when it is. When distribution, I guess, is still yeah. part of his or more so part of his responsibilities. Like, I guess when they have that partnership, which is shooter and distributor, you can kind of fall in the same patterns. Right. But it seems like the complete portfolio is on display from Matthews when he's apart from Marner, because I guess he's got to do a little bit more. And that's not to say Domi and Bertuzzi aren't doing anything or not doing yeah. their jobs or not doing enough uh, compared to Marner. But it just seems like Austin Matthews can maybe be his complete self when he's in the Sidney Crosby role, which is mm -hmm. to play with two players who can dig the puck out for him so that he can do everything just as Sidney Crosby did all, all those years. Like, I, I don't know if it's the main reason why I like three uh, or like uh, the talent spread across three lines. Mm -hmm. I think it's just because you need three lines as opposed to two. But Matthews looking just as good or better is a wonderful byproduct of, of spreading the talent across three lines. Absolutely. And yeah, I just, it's very, very interesting to me what Keith is going to do here because I think Marner had his moments tonight, but he's definitely a little lost playing with Tavares and McMahon. And yeah, like, you know, you know, I think it's a pretty clear, it's a pretty clear, uh, both guys make each other better when Matthews and Marner are playing together. Like they both elevate each other. I don't think one is better at it than the other. I think they both really just go well together, but it's found like Matthews has had the time where he's found it without him. And I don't know if there's enough time for Marner to kind of find it without Matthews. And I don't think like he's coming back off two games off of a high ankle sprain, which is a horrible injury. And that's a tough one to come back from. I'm glad he's got a, a couple, you know, what, what do they have left? Six games here to kind of get back into rhythm. But yeah, I, I think that's going to be the really, you know, sort of fascinating thing to watch is how Marner sort of develops in this role. Because to me, you can't break up what Bertuzzi, Dome, and Matthews are doing right now. It's just a perfect sort of serendipitous, serendipitous you know, Bertuzzi digs out the puck. It gets into a loose area and Domi has the ability to make the tight, skill plays where he can find Matthews. Matthews can find Bertuzzi around the front of the net. It's just, it just feels like it's really, really clicking. And I don't know if that's something you want to break up, but at the same time, you don't want to lose your second best player here. So it's a really fascinating one for Keith, and it's going to be one of his harder coaching jobs, I think. Yeah, and some of the responsibility shifting, right? Like uh, Mitch Marner not killing as many penalties in this game is definitely a storyline, but it was also Mitch Marner and John Tavares handling the Sidney Crosby matchup. And that makes me a little bit concerned because I don't know if John Tavares can hang with the likes yeah. of Sidney Crosby or Barkov, like et cetera down the line. I guess Barkov would probably be uh, dealing with Matthews if, if Paul Maurice had his way. 
But if it's about shutdown, if Mitch Marner is shut down, and if he plays with Matthews, it's just best on best. And if it's Tavares, it's mm -hmm. you know Tavares and Marner versus the competition's best. About that, like it definitely opens up Matthews. But then it's all on Matthews to produce, and the Leafs have mm -hmm. fallen in that trap where it's been all on Matthews to produce. Uh, Tavares yeah. in the top shutdown role, maybe maybe is asking too much, and then you're kind of seeding away some of the defensive zone responsibilities that Austin Matthews actually thrives in. So yeah. I don't, I, I could see we're talking reflexive uh, nature of coaches. Like I could see Keith wanting to go back a because Tavares might be running around in circles chasing the best player on the opposite team. And you know that you might be a little bit better in those scenarios if you have Martyr and Matthews playing head to head in a shutdown hybrid capacity, which is great and all, but it might also neutralize both top lines. And then it Absolutely. becomes a battle of depth and the Maple Leafs consistently lose the battle of depth. So yeah. that's, I think the trap they could easily fall in, but if Tavares and Martyr can handle top line duty and they did pretty well against Crosby, just great, mm -hmm. despite Crosby pretty being pretty loud in the game. Uh, yeah. I think that's a huge benefit. Nylander and yeah. Matthews on different lines away from top players. That sounds really good to me. Yeah. And I thought Nylander was flying around tonight. Like, you mentioned Matthews in the defensive zone. He is a real calming presence. Like when he has the puck in the defensive zone, there are not many guys in the league that I trust more to make the right decision. Like there was a play towards the end of the game. I don't know if it was tied yet or if it, if it was still 2-1 where somebody just kind of shot one out to him and he's standing basically in the blue paint and he takes one stick handle, puts it off the boards like a nice curling rock right into the neutral zone, just damage erased. And like, I, you know, the Selkie conversation to me, I, I don't pretend to be a smart enough hockey guy. Like I don't pour over the tape enough. I don't watch closely enough to all these other guys, but I watch Matthews on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can't picture there being many guys who are more elite defensively than Matthews is. It gets lost clearly because of the goal scoring ability. And that part of his game gets, you know, propped up, which it should. He scored 65 goals. It's unbelievable. But the defensive work and the defensive trust you can have in your number one guy, it's just, it's its remarkable. Yeah, it is. And, and it it's possible, too, that these two are better defensively when apart, right? Because yeah. when together, they're probably thinking one thing. When apart, I mean, Mitch Marner's mm -hmm. got to know that's part of his responsibility, playing with John Tavares against Sidney Crosby. And, of course, Austin Matthews has to understand, with Bertuzzi and Domi, arguably the two worst defensive players on the entire team, that he's yeah. going to have to be pretty good defensively in order for that to work. And I think, I don't know if he wants it to work. He's embracing that challenge of having it work, mm -hmm. though, for sure. I, I think he likes uh, the situation as is, even though, you know, he probably loves playing with Mitch Marner as well. But maybe he knows in his heart of hearts that this is the best thing for the team. So maybe separate, they're better or more mm -hmm. impactful defensively. And maybe that's just because there's stronger defensive players out there you know, whatever, 50%. I don't even know what it would be. I'm not a math guy. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, you're just having more of a defensive sports, impact but... <laughs> because one of those two players is on the ice all the time. So it, yeah. it, it works out well that way if, the, if Tavares can't hang in the middle of the ice. So uh, something I'm always hesitant to do, and people make fun of me because I say that and then I do this, but it might be time for ref talk tonight, uh, Justin. Thought uh, thought it was a okay. tough night for the Stripes tonight. Yeah. I, I I don't particularly know which side it leans to i thought that you know the the clearly that they had the power play discrepancy a bit for the for the penguins or whatever but i just thought that they were really bad i thought they didn't really have control of the game i thought a few of the calls were awful i thought the one on willie was a terrible call i just i you know it's not often that it sticks out to me enough i mean the geo one geo not getting how do you not miss that was just insane See, the man has the puck on his stick and he's going through the neutral zone and he just puts his stick between his legs and trips him. Puck don't lie, obviously. The guy it's they impossible. score, they end up getting one. But then at the end of the game, I don't know if you noticed, Bobby McMahon comes around the net with the puck on his stick, ref leaning on the net, staring at it, and Latang just hauls him down and does nothing. I, I just, like, you know, he gets underneath him there. He draws that. I. This is what worries me getting close to playoffs. And this is kind of the reason I bring it up is there's always that first round overcorrection where like think of the parade to the penalty box the last two years in the first round with the Leafs and Lightning, where it's just been like, you know, 
we talk about Sheldon Keefe and he's like, I feel like there's going to be violence. And he starts these guys and there's six <laughs> penalties per game on each side. And I just, I hope that it's not like this in the playoffs where they're calling everything because I think it's better when you let have a physical play, but we're getting towards playoff time. And it, this game just felt like a playoff game where they were calling all these ticky tack things. And it gave me a bit of PTSD. I guess that's where it's coming from. Yeah. I mean, it's tail as old as time, like a couple missed or bad calls early and it's impossible to just nip that in the bud and call a yeah. regular game after that. Yeah, exactly. Like it just spirals out of control, bad calls made on both sides. Like it happens at every level of hockey. It's going to happen in beer league games on a nightly basis where it's just, okay, you start, you try to set some standard or the standard shifts and then mm -hmm. there's no way you can get it back on the rails. And it felt like that tonight where it was like they were trying to make it up to each team, each coach, each superstar player. Uh, and then, I mean, the thing that bothered, most, bothered me most about the refereeing, even though it went under official review, is Sidney Crosby not drawing a penalty on that Bobby McMahon high stick, like, because he jammed the puck back into the face of Sidney Crosby. <laughs> I guess by letter of the law, it's not I a high it was stick. Right call. But I mean, at some point, we got to use common sense. It's, I thought he was going to get a major. I thought they were reviewing it for a major, like a slash to the face uh, that was just completely and utterly reckless. And yet the puck spins at a perfect angle and lodges itself between Crosby's face and McMahon's stick, and it's not called anything. It's just, I mean, it's just acidine. Like if that happened to a Leaf, uh, it would in a playoff game, it would be yeah. there would be riots. Uh, it's just <laughs> it's ridiculous that common sense can't prevail. But boy, do they twist themselves in knots. I thought Simmer was absolutely on fire tonight. And, and uh, CC just to be like, well, what, what if the puck wasn't there? Then what? Like, it's like, it's very obvious, but no teeth. But, yeah. but the puck hit his face and the stick didn't hit his face. It hit the puck. So, by the letter of the law, they got <laughs> it right. True. But I can't yeah. believe they didn't overturn it. Like, that is a obvious high stick in the face. That is a form, like, maybe not a four minute penalty because I didn't actually see any it's blood. It's a bad play. Yeah. But, like, yeah, that is a penalty. Every hockey game in the history of hockey, that has been a penalty. So I uh, I thought they got it right because of the letter of the law, but the letter of the law may be stupid, Justin. That's maybe what this comes down to. Yeah, and, and you know, replay. It's just, you, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get bad things if you introduce more and more replay uh, because mm -hmm. it, it it creates scenarios like this one where common sense has to be thrown out the window because of what actually happened, I suppose. It wasn't the only uh, scary Sidney Crosby play. I mean, Jake McCabe sort of taking him out there. Mm -hmm. It was like reminiscent of Steven Stamkos all those years yeah. ago with the broken leg, like hard shin off the post. It's just, uh, th that made me like, uh, you know, it was the devil and the angel on each shoulder. Like yeah. that one was all, oh, oh my God, Sydney, we better be okay because we can't be having this right now. Uh, that looks the Olympics scary. Olympics flashes for like my eyes. Part of the exactly. And him colliding with Matthews and they both kind of recoiled off the ice a yeah. little bit. It was like, oh man, there was a moment there <laughs> for Sydney Crosby who was just getting banged up, but uh, yeah. I guess no worse for wear. I have to, okay, so we've done some positive stuff. I got to talk to you about one of the things that's worrying me a lot. And I thought since he came over from the Ducks, Ily Labushkin has been pretty strong. But the last, I don't want to know, I don't know, a week, I feel like the, the, the play's been dipping a little bit, and specifically with the puck on his stick. There, he made a brutal turnover tonight for that led to the first goal. I just, I feel like yeah. he's the right-hand shot, and Keith seems to really like him. And like this play, if you're watching on YouTube or Sportsnet Plus, like that is just, that's something in a playoff game that, you know, that'll, that'll drive you to, to, to insanity. You just, you can't have something like that. And I think he's been good since he's come over, but I think there's been a serious dip in the last week or so. And I think he won't be on the bubble because he shoots right. And I think he'll probably play a little bit too much. Like I remember in that Tampa series where he got exposed in that first year against Tampa. And just, you know, it seems like he plays him a lot with with Riley. I saw Ben Wap there a little bit later on in the game. But I would say on my list of concerns with this heading in towards the playoffs, keep overplaying Labushkin and not considering him an option as like part of the mix to come in and out. Because I didn't think he was very good at all tonight. And that that turnover was brutal. Yeah, as long as Morgan Riley's his number one uh, defense partner, I mean, he's going to be playing too much, right? Like, it, I, yeah. I think he's fine, ultimately, in a number six role, a sheltered yeah. role, 
a role where you're, you know, helping stabilize a Timothy Lilligren type, although you'd never see him with Lilligren because of the handedness, of course. Yeah. Um, but like, that's when you feel comfortable and Riley's not that like, it's never, I mean, searching for a Riley, perfect Riley partner forever. And they will probably do that until the end of time. Uh, but I don't think Labushkin is it, even though he carries most of the traits uh, that you want. It's funny though, that Labushkin's uh, downfall or, or the dip in his play has yeah. happened at a time where TJ Brody's given you a little bit more. And that was a great yep. pass, obviously, to Matthew Nyes uh, for the Nyes goal. Nyes, by the way, loves playing for Kyle Dubas or in front of Kyle Does Dubas. Does he ever? Um, but, you know, he's played he's played bit better lately. And they're mm -hmm. not, like, connected. You know, it's not like either Labushkin or Brody. They're different players, despite, you know, I guess history of playing on the right side. But... I don't know. Maybe you have to reconfigure the pieces. Like I was pretty certain what it was going to look like at some point, especially yeah. if you have Edmondson and Lilligren available, but now I'm not so sure, right? Like maybe Benoit Riley and, and you're trying to move Riley around a little bit more given or assuming that uh, Edmondson and, and Lilligren are going to be there. But I just feel like it's the, the puzzle pieces don't fit perfectly yet. Yeah. I think you got enough there. It's just configuring it the right way. And, as much as I thought they were trending towards it, like it's going to require Labushkin to play a lot and he's got to play better. If he's going to play a lot. Yeah. And I, I, I actually have really liked Labushkin for the most part since he came over. And I thought he was, you know, people called him literally the worst player in the league when he got traded for. And I don't, I don't actually think he's that clearly, but I do think that he's gone South mm -hmm. a bit. And yeah, cause I think Keith mentioned after the Montreal game that Lilligren may be able to play, in one of the last two games before the, the regular season ends and yarn croc may be coming back then to Edmonton later this week. You're right. I, I, I think all these spots are totally up for grab game one and it game one, it may be completely different game too. Like they they've talked about it multiple different times. True living's talked about how it's going to be by committee. Same with Keith, how it's going to be by committee. It's going to be very, very, very different game to game. I think, and I'm not sure that's the, a great thing, but you could also convince me that it's not the worst thing either. Give a team a different look, have different people coming into the lineup. You know, the, the, the negativity of that would be that you'd have lack of cohesion, but feels like everybody's played with everybody anyway. So it's going to be very, very fascinating to see how he does it towards the end of this. But yeah, uh, not great for old Labushkin. On the other side of it, you mentioned Brody. Also thought Riley was excellent tonight. Riley uh, really snapping it around, moving his feet well. Looked like he's coming back from that injury. Heading towards the time of year where he's very valuable for the Leafs, when he's always good in the first round, uh, liked his game a lot tonight. I think he's trending in a positive direction. Yeah, I liked his game too. Uh, it, it, not that they're tells, but the more he seems to be involved with other superstar players, the better it is. Like that might be like uh, obviously. Uh, but sometimes uh, Morgan Riley can get bogged down, I think, by the assignment to a certain mm -hmm. extent. But when it flows and when he's doing, as you mentioned, snapping it around, when he's just one of the guys, one of the superstar guys, it just feels like that's when he's feeling it. And if he's feeling it at the right time, uh, that's obviously a good thing uh, for the Maple Leafs. Yeah. He's going to have to play a lot. He's going to have to play uh, as good as he did last year in order for mm -hmm. it, it, it to work, probably. I mean, the matchup's going to be hard either way. He's probably going to be in over his head just by his deployment and who his partner might be either way. Uh, but Morgan Riley is going to have to step up and be, you know, you can do pay grade, you can do pedigree, you can do history, whatever you want to do. Mm. Uh, you could do leadership, like whatever way you want to measure his importance, it's important. It's there. Uh, and Morgan Riley looks like he's turning up in the right direction. I mean, it's obviously been an uneven season, uh, but him for be healthy at this time of year and, and playing well, like it's utmost importance for the Maple Leafs. Last two things before we go. Uh, first thing, penalty kill, great again tonight. Uh, really positive that this is happening, heading towards the playoffs. They they just they look a lot more aggressive. They think they're making quicker decisions out there. Credit to the guys that they brought in. Like Dewar looks like he's really more confident out there. Uh, you know, having Marner back helps. Camp's been good, so it's good to see the penalty kill. And uh, Jobo put in our chat here. That Sullivan said Crosby had a skate issue, which why is why he didn't start OT, according to Luke Fox. So, I mean, did Malkin have a skate issue too? I got, you know, it's like you got, you got makes Malkin a little both. bit more sense, but not the, not yeah, the full yeah, picture. You, you could have started Lars Eller and Malkin. 
you know, uh, I, I don't know. So, mm. uh, and Jobo says that Sammy got the belt. Uh, so Samsonov, not me. Yeah. He thought he was good tonight. I didn't think that it was like really worth, you know, bringing up. I didn't think he was a lead part of the story, but I guess the players on the team thought he was really good, but yeah. Starting goalie start tonight where he's solid, kept them in the game and they, and they, and they won it. So good for Samsonov. Yeah, part of the story, I think that he's not part of the story, honestly. Like, I've yeah. gotten to the point now where not worrying about Samsonov, expecting Samsonov to be uh, in the net, and, and like, the expectations or the the waiting on him to fall out of his rhythm, fall out of his yeah. pattern, fall out of the net, uh, just in a literal sense. <laughs> it's not Slide into the corner like, with I, no stick I don't think there's hand. any question. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's just not there for me anymore. Like, it's unequ- it's it's there's no it's indisputable at this point like who i want to yeah. see out there i know what i want in the future but right now and in the present it's riding Ilya samsonov as as much as you can uh yeah the fact that he's just quietly getting the belt now instead of like full pop and circumstance because, <laughs> oh my god Ilya samsonov played well like that's a great thing i think uh for the toronto maple leafs and you mentioned doer like that was a pretty savvy little move there uh for brad for living no fanfare whatsoever, but all of a sudden he's logging PK minutes, taking minutes over Marner, maybe by necessity, but just the fact that he's able to do go out there and do a job, solidify or yeah. help solidify a fourth line, like it was a nice little addition uh, for Bradshaw Living, who his resume has looked a lot better as time has passed here uh, for the Absolutely. Maple Leafs in his first, first year. Boy, Dewar, you, you wouldn't exactly call him, uh, you wouldn't exactly call him Guy Lafleur with the hands, though. Holy. He kind of beats it to a square like no. that, that, that pass or shot or whatever he tried to do in that two on one camp doer, uh, two on one. That's a nightmare blunt rotation right there, buddy. Those two together. <laughs> that is not what you want to see on a two on one. It's not pretty at all, but yeah, I, I liked it. You know, Hey, every, every band needs a tuba player. You need some butchers out there. It can't all be pretty. And I think he's been good. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I think that is, and it was like 15 minutes after the deadline. We were on air. We didn't even know how to pronounce his aim, name when they got him. So uh, credit to <laughs> to uh, True Living, and he's under control. So you can get him for a cheap contract next next year. Keep control, cheap controllable guy. Say that five times fast. So yeah. So uh, in summation, great night for the Leafs uh, to send Kyle packing with his jacket on. Uh, Big one for me personally. I know everybody listens to the show, listens to me crap on Kyle Dubas. I Kipper and Born, our news and notes segment for a month straight was us just crapping all over Kyle Dubas. So this was kind of a crucial win for the takes. I don't cheer for takes. I really don't. But yeah. tonight I was cheering for the Leafs and the takes. So uh, thank you, Leafies, for giving me this one. It's a big goal, Leaf go in the McKee household tonight. Big goal, Leaf go night. There you go. Shout yeah. out to Jake McCabe. Uh, uh, maybe uh, an unlikely finish uh, to an important uh, result for the McKee yeah. household. I will say one more thing I loved from yeah. the game. That yes. Max Domi just grabbed Michael Bunting at one point. Just I, yeah. I just loved it. I loved it. Uh, I wish we saw the full thing, although we'll never see the full thing involving Michael Bunton. But never. love that Max Domi kind of knew the assignment to a certain extent. What's uh, Michael Bunting doing taking slappers or one-timers from the, or attempting one-timers from the high slot on the power play? Maybe that's why it stunk all year long for the Penguins. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's, yeah, that's wouldn't be my deployment for old uh, number eight now. No. And listen, like he was a bluffer the whole time he was here. Like he ran around, he did stuff. He never dropped his gloves. I was never a big fan of him. Like there's, he, there's drive to the airport guys. And he was definitely in that category. I, I was never a huge fan of Michael Bunting and he gave Domi a really hard ride. Like he shoved his head right into the boards. That wasn't like a just challenge him for no reason. Domi was obviously pissed, and Bunting's just not gonna not gonna go him. And I, I've loved that about Domi. He is the passion is off the charts with this guy. He's tried to like the guys who he's fought this year. He fought Bennett. He fought Gudis. Tried to fight Marchand. Now he's going after Bunting. Like. He, this guy reads the, you know, I don't know, he reads the Toronto Star. He knows who, he knows who Leaf fans hate. Like, it's amazing the guys he's gone <laughs> after. So credit to Domi. Uh, I, I love it. So y'all good, Justin? Listen, I'm, I'm a little terrified. I'm a little mm. terrified to see him in the playoffs, but I am so excited. Like, I think he knows the assignment. He's a Domi. He knows the assignment. Yes. He understands. Let's just hope he can uh, keep himself out of serious trouble when it matters the most. Absolutely. All right. This lease talk. Oh, I got to do the JD Bonkets thing. You got to like this. 
You got to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify, or is it Apple Podcasts? I don't think it's iTunes anymore. Is it, I think it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Like this video, leave a comment, even if it's a mean one. Actually, don't leave mean ones because those hurt my feelings. And uh, do all the nice stuff, like, watch, share. Uh, Justin Cuthbert from Fan Pregame, thanks so much for sticking around at the station for us. I know you uh, you can't be yelling at home about the Leafs, so really appreciate it, brother. And I'll see you tomorrow at the station.